Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to this wonderful lecture session from the Horror Programme at the University of the Underground. I'm Aggie Haynes. I'm head of the Pro Horror Programme, which is a critical exploration into illicit societal fears and human passion for horror. So we're investigating institutions and popular culture through the lens of the horror genre in dramaturgy, film, costume making and more. So the University of the Underground, it's free. It's a pluralistic and transnational university founded in 2017. And it's birthed in the basements of nightlife venues. So we're non-profit, we're a registered charity. If you'd like to donate, please visit the University of the Underground.org. On this website, you can find other exciting programming times and events. Also, all of the lectures like this amazing one is always posted on our YouTube and Instagram, and there's other lectures that you can find on there as well. So I'm really, really excited because we have Xavier Mendick today, who's a professor of cult cinema studies at Bir Birmingham City University. Uh, he also runs the annual Cine Excess International Film Festival. I'll put a link in the chat here which um it's awesome to check out the website uh, he's the author editor and co-editor of nine volumes on cult cinema traditions including bodies of desire and bodies of in distress the golden age of italian cult cinema peep shows cult film and the cine erotic and the cult film reader so xavier has also completed 12 documentaries on cult cinema, including Tax Shelter Terrors, The Real Story of Canadian Cult Film, and That's Le Mort, uh, Indian Cult Cinema and the Years of Lead. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, yeah, feel free to, to share your screen, take over. We're really excited to talk more about the documentary that we will watch. Wonderful. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of share my screen, but just to say, uh, Again, I'll reiterate it in my sort of talky bit. What what an uh, honor and a pleasure it is to join you here at the University of the Underground. And what a radical and inclusive course structure you've got. And I, I urge academics from you know global institutions to sort of partner and get involved with this, with this worthy institution. I'm a big believer in synchronicity. So a lot of today, um, my time has been gobbled up, not only re-preparing my talk but Scream 5 came out I guess it came out every it came out in the UK today so the phone lines have been hot I've got a PhD student I work with uh, who's doing a PhD on queer interpretations of the slasher film so both he and I have spent all day today dialoguing with internal and external bodies talking about Scream 5 and the slasher film so I think it's synchronicity I'm turning up at the University of the Underground to also talk about um, horror films. Um, I am going to share my screen. Let what an honour and a pleasure it is to be here at the uh, University of the Underground. I'm a big supporter of the radical inclusive um, horror programme that Victoria and Aggie have, have set up and, and I'm, I'm encouraging all international uh, you know academic institutions with an interest in horror to participate dialogue and collaborate with this worthy kind of venture so genuinely thank you I think it's a really innovative project and I know for sure that myself and colleagues at Birmingham City University are really keen to collaborate with you so thank you once again. So um, for the time I've got with you this evening, I wanted to provide really kind of contextualizing overview to the documentary we watched earlier tonight, which is entitled The Quiet Revolution, State Society in the Canadian Horror Film. Um, and my hope is that the talk I'm about to give is, will maybe open up some questions from the audience, maybe about the documentary, maybe how it was made, maybe about some of the research that underpins it, or maybe just about, you know, wider issues of horror, popular culture, institutions, the body, you know, those kind of things that dominate the genre that we could we can maybe dialogue about. So I'm going to leave it open to whatever folks want to talk about. So let me give you <clears throat> some context of the study about the documentary you've just seen. And folks can give me a nod that the screen has changed. Yep. Okay, excellent. All right. So just to give you a brief context of the documentary, The Quiet Revolution, um, it was completed initially by myself and researchers at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. It was commissioned by the UK based distributor 101 film. So I guess as an academic, it, it, it was a really vibrant dialogue between 
different academic communities and industry. And throughout my career, that sort of industry into academia overlap has been central really to, to my own profile. I think Cine Excess is, has a, a USB as an industry into academia event. So that's very much my kind of, you know, my position. I really like those projects where you bring industry and academia together. And bearing in mind that we've got such a cosmopolitan international audience for this horror course, I, I could see some amazing, um, you know, uh, collaborations both within and beyond national borders between different academic communities and different industries. So that I think is quite exciting. So you have had a number of partners come together um, um, and the project was initially generated as two commissioned docu documentary artifacts. So I'm always interested, you know, um, I, I've got to confess really, I mean, I've had no film training as a filmmaker whatsoever, okay? So I, I do these things, I make these documentaries and then I lay awake at night worrying whether they make sense to the viewer, whether they tell their story. So I'd be really keen just as a show of nods or head shaking, <laughs> hopefully not too much head shaking. Did it kind of make sense as a story, as a narrative? Yeah, okay, that's that's some 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 nodding there. So hopefully that that sort of makes sense. So but hopefully what we also disguised is you were watching not one but two documentaries, okay? So originally The Quiet Revolution was two documentaries that came out in um, 2019. Um, the first documentary was an 80 minute production and it considered tensions within 1960s and 1970s Quebec society and how those tensions impacted on a range of controversial horror productions. The second part of the documentary examined more recent film traditions, excuse me, from the 1990s to the present. And it also considered the impact of women filmmakers and indigenous horror directors who are challenging the conceptions of Canadian national cinema. And I, I kind of, as a horror fan, first and foremost, I'd be really keen afterwards to hear Aggie's views on this. My own belief is that we are in a new golden age of horror. Something really radical and interesting is happening right now. I'm a massive fan of 70s horror. For me, that used to be the golden era of horror, really radically socially incisive movies. I kind of still feel that, but I kind of feel that right now, something quite dramatic and fascinating is taking place. But the interesting thing is it's mediated through issues of belonging issues of sexuality, issues of diaspora, issues of ethnicity. And that was very much some of the arc of what that second project or the second artifact looked at. We were really proud of the fact that we offered the first critical overview of Canada's new generation of indigenous filmmakers who have subsequently gone on to, to, to create more um, in Interesting. So they were at the arc of their development when they appeared in the Quiet Revolution. They're now powering. You know, there's more and more Indigenous horror films coming <clears throat> coming out. They're all really fascinating. Now, across both of these parts, uh, we integrated a wide range of archive materials, and they were provided by production companies and Canadian training centres. And we supplemented to these film extracts and exclusive interviews from filmmakers, historians and cultural commentators. Um, as I said, both parts were initially released in 2019, <clears throat> excuse me, and they benefited from a national release strategy developed by 101 Films as the commissioning agent. Part one of the documentary appeared on the remastered UK release of David Cronenberg's 1977 film, Rabid. The second part of the documentary um, appeared on the remake of Rabid, uh, which was directed by two fascinating um, Canadian women directors, Jennifer and Sylvia Soska. I don't know if anyone in the audience is familiar with the Soska sisters. I'm really proud to say that we've secured the Soska sisters 
as visiting fellows at Birmingham City University. So they are their mentors to our students, which is which is awesome. Um, both parts of the documentary sold in excess of 3,500 copies and generated positive press coverage. So that sort of trajectory <clears throat> um, gave us the idea of developing a 96 minute cut of the documentary in 2020. And that 96 minute cut is the festival cut that has this evening been screened at the University of the Underground. And if there are any filmmakers in the audience, proper filmmakers, not academic filmmakers like me necessarily, um, it's not just a case of um, juxtaposing part one with part two, you have to reorient the narrative. So it was quite an intensive task. Um, now, the festival cut seeks to not only explore controversies associated with Canadian horror, but also to kind of get under the bonnet as to why Canadian horror is so frequently excluded from academic accounts of Canadian film or Canadian national cinema. I would argue that any books you read on Canadian national cinema, the references to horror, A, will be very thin on the ground, and B, will only be focused on David Cronenberg, and C, will only really be focused on David Cronenberg from the late 70s, early 1980s onwards. So there's some real gaps in the knowledge base here, and we were interested to understand why. One case study, in fact, that we explored were the controversies surrounding 1970s Canadian horror and the so-called tax shelter funding scheme that was really responsible for the exclusion of horror from um, the orthodoxy, you know, this was an extremely um, controversial set of, of funding um, techniques. So what I want to do in the time I've got with you is really two things. I firstly want to outline the key features of the 1970s tax shelter scheme and outline why it was so controversial. And secondly, I want to conclude on a discussion of a key company that were really, they really pioneered um, horror in Canada from the 1970s onwards. And that was the Montreal based company, Cinepix. Um, and I guess really, if there was a catchphrase to badge these two areas together that I'm going to look at, the catchphrase would be Canada's great shame. So let's have a look at Canada's great shame. Now, when I talk about Canada's great shame, specifically, I'm referring to the tax shelter scheme that has a extremely negative reputation. In fact, you will find, I think um, Christopher Gittings is the probably the most celebrated book on Canadian cinema. And I think he devotes half a page to the tax shelter scheme. Other accounts, devote even less. And if they do have devote time, they're all profoundly negative. Um, so I, I'm, I'm using the term here, Canada's great shame um, in, in honor of the, a very interesting theorist called Ben Wright, who uses the title for his 2012 study on 70s cinema. And the great thing is Ben Wright's study is available online, Canada's great shame, so do check it out. You'd be mistaken for thinking that Ben Wright here, when he talks about Canada's great shame, is in fact talking about the controversial and visceral releases of David Cronenberg, um, such as Rabid, which I know some folks may have seen earlier in the week from the, the link I provided. However, the, the title of his article, and indeed his study, relates less to the content of David Cronenberg as a director, and more to the wholly negative reception of the state-funded um, schemes that facilitated his early forays into horror cinema. Specifically, what Wright is doing is contextualizing why Canadian horror is so marginal and linking it to a set of commercial funding schemes that took place within the 1970s. And specifically, um, uh, um, Wright identifies two waves of state investment into Canadian cinema that led to a proliferation of horror cinema 
and also a notoriety of horror cinema. So he identifies two waves of state funding into popular uh, film that led to an explosion in, in, in horror film. And I have to say, what I find really fascinating is particularly in Europe, but not only in Europe, there's been, you know, North America, Europe, Australia even, they've all had these schemes where they believe their national cinema is not cutting the mustard. It's not really prolific. So they, they, fund, they plunge state money into uh, a film with the idea that it will provoke a new golden age of national cinema. But what happens time and time again is Wiley producers take the money and think, well, what's selling? Sexploitation sells at the cinema. Horror sends, sells at the cinema. Kung Fu sells at the cinema. So what is fed back to the state that's funded it is really a horror, a real horror, because they're thinking, my God, the taxpayer has funded these horror movies. So it always ends up being controversial. And for Wright, there's two waves of controversy, um, which he identifies which was responsible for the explosion of Canadian horror in the 1970s. First of all, in 1967, there was a launch of the Canadian Film Development Corporation. And basically the Canadian Film Development Corporation was seeking to address a chronic under expansion of feature film production in Canada at the time. Anyone who knows a little about Canadian film will know that obviously they've been dwarfed by the proximity to Hollywood. And it's been very difficult for the for them to develop their own national cinema. So what they've tended to, or historically what had happened is um, they'd, they'd over-invested in documentary films. So a famous British document, uh, documentary um, uh, uh, filmmaker went over to Canada and um, uh, developed a national film board there. So the focus was never on popular film or feature film or fiction film, it was always on documentary, to the extent that you'd have a mass exodus of Canadian filmmakers, just because they couldn't find work. Um, and so the Canadian Film Development Corporation in 1967 kind of basically said something has to give. We can't keep having this flood of talent away from Canada. We need some state funding. Um, so basically what the, the uh, corporation did is they gave, a, it was a 10 million pound government fund headed up by a very respected former filmmaker, Michael Spencer and Michael Spencer's there on the slide. What it meant was producers could bid for up to $300,000 Canadian dollars per product per production for a film that demonstrated identifiable Canadian elements. So those Canadian elements could be the content, the crew, or the creation. There just had to be something Canadian-like and to be innovative and new to unlock the funding. And um, so between 1968 and 1974, a range of new innovative projects from emerging filmmakers were greenlit by the Canadian Film Development Corporation. Um, on this slide, I'm just highlighting three early successes. Donald Sh Shabib's melancholic crime drama, Going Down the Road, which is a very interesting film, charts the downfall of two rural misfits who seek a new life of opportunity in Toronto. Um, this acclaimed production was co-written by William Fruitt, whose own directorial debut, Wedding in White, from 1972, provided another critical that no time saying critical, not economic, not economic, a critical success for the CFDC, Canadian Film Development Corporation. And William Fruitt, you may recall, was in the documentary that you saw earlier today. Now, he, I've always thought William Fruitt is a really fascinating filmmaker, and his debut film, Wedding in White, casts Donald Pleasance an over, as an overbearing patriarch who forces his own daughter to marry her rapist in order to protect the family's fragile reputation. So there's some really powerful themes of, you know, family repression and toxic masculinity effectively going on in, in that movie. Um, the psychological tensions implicit in William Fruit's films were matched by another CFDC-backed entry, also on the, on the slide here, William Peterson's 1973 film, Paperback Hero. 
which details the decline of a Saskatchewan hockey player who believes he's in fact a Wild West gun fighter. So you can start to see a quite varied, quirky range of films um, that were being funded by the Canadian Film Development Corporation in this early period. And if I just look at Paperback Hero on my right, your left of the slide there, it, it gained a number of plaudits. It won the Best Canadian Film Awards in the following categories. It won an award um, for editing, cinematography and sound. So it had a lot going for it. However, it suffered the same fate as the other CFDC-backed projects, namely poor distribution. And this was a, a current problem, or a, a, a reoccurring problem, because despite being backed by um, the state through the Canadian Film Development Corporation, these films were unable to compete with Hollywood blockbusters that were still flooding Canadian screens. Um, in fact, distribution data from that era reveals that out of 101, 101 CFDC backed projects, only two managed to gain widespread distribution. So you start to see the problems that this culture was facing, even with government support. So therefore, when um, the government renewed its financial commitment to the Canadian um, development fund in 1974 it did so with an increased eye towards commerciality and export markets as a way of recouping its production costs so filmmakers were still able to apply for up to 300,000 Canadian dollars to the CFDC however this funding could be supplemented or replaced by a new capital cost allowance scheme, also known as the tax shelter, um, derived from private finance. So there was a, a government act in Canada in 1974, the Capital Cost Allowance Act, and it allowed financiers, lawyers, and investment houses to negotiate a patchwork of private investment to get films made. And it led to bigger budgets and, and higher exports than could have been done just by the CFDC alone. Okay, so this scheme specifically targeted middle class and professional investors by offering them an ability to recoup 100% of their costs against their annual tax returns. Okay, so further incentive was that you could make a tax, you could, you could put money into a, a Canadian tax shelter film, even if the film wasn't deemed commercial, never even got off the ground, you'd still be able to recoup your tax at, in your annual tax return. Does that make sense? You have people investing in films that are never gonna be made, right? And the auditors are still saying, well, doesn't matter, there you go, tax return, tax return, tax return, tax return. And these tax returns were always in December, right? So what you'll find, if you look at all of the movies in Canada that came out from the mid 1970s onwards, their date of release or completion is always December because that's the point where the money is released. So you start to smell a bit of an economic rat really that maybe people are investing in these movies because they see them as kind of quick fixes to their, you know, if you're a doctor and you owe the tax man money, rather than paying the money, you'll invest in a movie. And it doesn't really matter if the movie gets made or not, you're still gonna get a tax deduction. So implicit in this alteration of government mindset <coughs> was also changed from viewing film as a means of cultural expression to seeing it more and more as a vehicle for commercial exploitation. And I think this alteration is very much embodied by the installation of a new CFDC head, Michael McCabe. And Michael McCabe, I think it's brilliant. Michael McCabe is on that slide there. And I don't know if people can see behind Michael McCabe is a picture of the brood. Now, every time I look at images of Michael McCabe, I always think without being disrespectful, it looks more like a porn producer than a government employee. And that still with him and the brood behind really speaks volume of the way in which commerce was king through the tax shelter scheme. Now. Before we get too critical, it's absolutely important to say that under McCabe's reign, there was a dramatic expansion in Canadian film production. 
through the tax shelter scheme. So it accelerated from just four releases in 1974 to 40 in 1978, up again to 70 in 1979. So you start to see this massive crescendo of productions. 1979 to 1980 was the peak year for tax shelter productivity. Um, and what was interesting is as the tax shelters became more and more common in Canada, um, the real project development strategy and the marketing development changes, there becomes more and more of an emphasis on faded American stars who are imported into Canada to give these films a bit of a cosmopolitan feel. And what some people have argued is that the Canadian market start to vanish so this could be in in the in the location of anywhere but it looks like a a typical american setting so the whole canadianness some critics have argued um uh starts to disappear to make these films as commercially viable as possible and top of the commercial viability tree was horror now if we have a look um at some of the titles on the next slide, it's worth us kind of pausing and have a look at these. Some of the key titles that were funded through the tax shelter scheme of between 1979 and 1980, the peak year coming up now are as follows. We've got a number of them here. Now, it would be wrong to say that horror was the only beneficiary of the tax shelter scheme, but you can see the highly generic nature of what we've got on um, the slide here, you know, everything from my left, maybe your right, happy birthday to me, kind of slasher horror film, sex comedy meatballs in the middle there, terror train, um, prom night, the brood at the bottom, the changeling, death ship. Has anyone ever seen Out of the Blue, that, that film in the middle? It's actually a really weird, it's a very dark film. It was a tax shelter film with a Canadian director who they fired. And um, at the last minute, they had to get Dennis Hopper to direct it. And anyone knows that about, about Dennis Hopper? He's a very rebellious figure. But my goodness, he really pulls it out the bag without the boots. A very unnerving, you know, family, dysfunctional family teen drama. It's recently had a, an amazing restoration. Alongside what becomes clear, I think, to all of us is just the over generic nature of what's going on here. Look at the marketing of these movies as well. You know, uh, my personal favorite has to be Happy Birthday to Me. You know, there's a guy being stabbed to death with a shish kebab and the tagline is, John will never eat shish kebabs again. What was also quite common from the marketing of these movies is, after this movie, you're never coming home. So Terror Train, don't waste money on a return fare. You're not coming back. Prom Night, if you're not back by midnight, you won't be coming home. So horror and the kind of, you know, the broad genre marketing strategies uh, really start to kind of populate the tax shelter era. And not surprisingly, um, this is not popular with Canada's cultural elite. There was a lot of criticism about the fact that national cinema has been debased by these horror productions. As um, problematic was the fact that um, um, they were becoming increasingly expensive to make, and there were big question marks about whether they were making back their money to, to, to investors. OK, so um, one um, a critic, a Wyndham Wise, has used a case study of the 1980s Cannes Film Festival in a very, very ill-fated campaign by the um, Canadian Film Development Corporation, CFDC. They said their big stand and promo for the 1980 Cannes Film Festival was, quote, Canada can and does. But Wyndham Wise says the reality was that Canadian films couldn't and didn't. And what he means by this is there was a mass rejection of Canadian tax shelter film after tax shelter film after tax shelter film got really bad reviews at the 1980 Cannes Film Festival. So what happened after that, after this poor reception is a lot of these films never got sold. OK, and so therefore people started thinking, what the hell am I am I investing in? 
Okay, so after that intense period of activity for wind and rise, the bubble was effectively bursting. So what you had is 40 to 70 million Canadian dollars wiped off the shares of, of these productions after Cannes in 1980. And it leads to the tax shelter scheme eventually being wound down in 1982. And people try not to talk about it that much because of the scandal it seems to, it seems to evoke. Um, the CFDC got it in the neck, not surprising me, and was later rebranded as Telefilm with a remit towards cultural cinema rather than popular film. And that really marks the, the end of this state intervention into horror, however controversial it was. Now, really, the tax shelter period didn't last that long, the maximum of eight years. But here we are in, in, in 2022, and even now, it has this really poor reputation for producing unpalatable, extreme, overtly commercial and economically unsustainable films that caused Canada's great shame. And what's interesting is this idea of Canada's great shame has moved beyond the funding scheme to infect the reputation of the companies who were associated with it. So by way of conclusion, I just want to briefly talk about Cinepix. And the reason I've chosen Cinepix is they were ca basically Canada's leading horror film outfit. And it's fair to say that the, a great many filmmakers, including David Cronenberg, owe their entire career to the intervention of Cinepix. So it's worth having a closing look at Cinepix, seeing how they reflected this Canadian shame, and also seeing if, if there is any merit in the horror films that they produce. So to start us off, something about um, Cinepix. I mean, created in 1964 by two fascinating people. Um, um, a Quebec-based uh, exhibitor, John Dunning, and John Dunning is the chap with the beard. You can see in both of those, in all of those articles, in all of those images rather. And he worked um, with a Hungarian emigre, Andre Link, who's the chap with the dark hair and the, and the glasses. Um, John Dunning unfortunately has died, which is why he's not in the uh, documentary that you, you saw. Uh, um, Greg Dunning, his son, is the, is the custodian of the Cinepix estate. Um, Andre Link is still alive. He, he, there's a number of fascinating interviews with, with Andre Link, who was a concentra concentration camp child survivor. So he was interned in a concentration camp as a Hungarian Jew and survived and um, demobbed to, to Canada. And I always think, what a fascinating trajectory that Andre Link has had and some of the films he's done. And he talks very openly about arriving in Canada and having such a sense of shame of his own body that had been battered by Nazi oppression. So these are always fascinating characters. I'm sure Aggie would agree that move into horror and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Andre Link is no different. So Cinepix, these two collaborators working together, soon become the key exhibitor in Quebec. And between 1964 and 1968, they did develop a reputation for importing European films into the region. And I think the reason why European films were popular in, in, in Quebec is not only because of the French Canadian vibe, that, that, but, but also European films tended to be racy and you could see a lot of nude or relative amounts of nudity that you couldn't see in Canadian films at the time. So what they did is they started to test audience tastes within Quebec and the French Canadian territories for the kinds of things they were importing. Then they realized we could probably do it better ourselves. So they moved in 1969 into production. And between 1969 and 1984, they created over 70 film releases um, that became notorious for using state funding to create films that were explicit and horrific. So they are the key case study of Canada's great shame. They used all of these private funding. You know, the interesting thing is <clears throat> when people criticize companies like Cinepix for using government funding, what, what they tend to overlook is the Cinepix releases with the were some of the few Canadian 
state funded films that made their money back and returned the money to the state. So ironically, the taxpayer made money back from Cinepix because of the popularity of their films, but that tends to get uh, missed out the narrative. So because of their connection with this debased funding scheme, they've largely been written out of all leading academic accounts of Canadian national film. Um, however, What's fascinating about Cinepix is there are a number of strands within their work that are quite interesting and maybe deserve closer attention. And these strands are as follows. So um, the first strand is what became known as maple, maple sex comedies that were reflective of wider social and gender transitions occurring during the private, sorry, the quiet revolution. And I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. A second strand is a medical, military and militant home invasion dramas that can be linked to wider terrorist fears. Thirdly, there were controversial historical dramas that expressed fears of internment and state repression. Fourthly, slasher films, i.e. horror films with a teen angle that revealed nationalistic concerns around disenfranchisement. And finally, unconventional teen dramas that were subversive in their attitudes towards gender and sexuality. And you'll see that there's a nice time scale here. So the maple syrup sex comedies are from 1969 to 74. Horror dominates from 1974 to 78 is replicated by con controversial historical dramas, 74 to 77, slasher films that go on from 81 to 82, and also teen dramas that take them from the late 70s to the late 80s. So guy these guys were really prolific. They were like a production line of controversy, if I can be so bold, from the late 60s to the late 80s. Um, so that's really why I think that it is worth briefly concluding by looking at Cinepix because I think their controversy or the controversial reputation they have obscures some quite interesting aspects to their work. So let's briefly, I'm not gonna go through all five strands because like the tagline for prom night, you'll never go home if I do that. So I'm just gonna focus on three of these. Um, first of all, the so-called maple syrup sex comedies that seem to be, um, reflective of wider social and gender transitions. Now, several commentators have noted that Cinepix's first film release was Valerie and 1969, and it coincided with the launch of the Canadian Film Development Fund. And a lot of was written about what a scandal it was that, um, that um, the CFDC were putting money into uh, films that were seen as erotic. Um, and but what's interesting is the CFDC's remit was to, to fund striking new visions of Canadian identity. And I think Valerie certainly embodies that. It's seen by Bill Marshall, the scholar, as an example of Quebec's cinema of modernization. And what he means by that, it is, it's a cinema production that directly reflects the social shifts that accompanied the so-called quiet revolution of the 1960s. And as we saw from the documentary, when we talk about the quiet revolution, what we mean is that French Canada installed a new liberal government in the region and also displaced dominant and repressive Catholic principles in favor of a process of modernization, industrial nationalization. So state, you know, electric gas, water industries were state owned and liberated. And there was a, a new liberal policy around um, welfare and education, particularly for women, which is quite interesting. Um, Marshall sees these new modern practices against the backdrop of a collapse in religious beliefs and pr um, practices in the province of Quebec, alongside an, um, a liberalization of sex attitudes. Um, so really it's against this backdrop of change <coughs> that I think the film Valerie, Cinepix's first film, can be located. Now in the documentary, we, you may have seen we, we, we cut in just a brief sequence from the very, very dramatic uh, uh, and evocative opening of, of Valerie. It's a film that charts the sexual evolution of naive teenager played by actress Danielle Umet. And in that opening charged um, scene, she rides out of a convent 
on the back of her rockabilly lover's motorbike in a renunciation of um, repressive sexual practices. Um, her subsequent odyssey takes in, in um, encounters with the 1960s counterculture, uh, uh, lesbian interactions and a period of prostitution before she accepts a role as a maternal substitute with her new lover and his son. So a new modern Quebecois family is created. And the ending of the film is quite interesting. You have the image of this new family standing together and alongside it, you have all of these um, Quebec flags unfurling in the background. So there's a really nice, nationalistic element to this. This is the thing that's always fascinated me about cult films is, and horror films is they do, you know, always portray a nationalistic perspective, however popular they are. Some colleagues may be familiar with um, the quite controversial film Straw Dogs. I don't know if that rings a bell with anyone. It was a quite infamous rape and revenge film from the 1970s. You may be less familiar with the Turkish version of Straw Dogs, which adapts the source material to fit Turkish sensibilities. So in the original, you have um, Dustin Hoffman fighting off rapists in this Cornish household. In the Turkish remake, it's a mother and daughter who have to repel Greek Cypriot thugs. Okay, And at the crucial moment when to show her independence and potency, the Turkish Cypriot mother rips open her blouse and rather than wearing a brassiere, she's got the Turkish flag wrapped around her torso. So like Valerie with unfolding flags, these are always kind of populist nationalistic um, narratives. And certainly it was the case with Valerie. And for Bill Marshall, um, Valerie lives on in legend, not only as Quebec's first pornographic film, but a popular feature that captured that period of the Quiet Revolution. It actually had an unrivaled box office um, status from 1969 to I think 1984. So no film in Canada between 1969 and 1984 made more money at the box office than Valerie, which is incredible. And despite the criticism, any money that the CFDC ploughed into Valerie was returned to the Canadian authorities, which in itself is interesting. So based on this success, Dunning and Link at Cinepix thought, well, we're in a market for so-called erotic, socially reflective films. And they marketed a series of other movies that then became known as maple syrup, porn, maple syrup because of the connection to Canada and porn because of their erotic content. Now, these early maple syrup releases positioned Cinepix as a key popular film producer, but it was their later work with David Cronenberg that brought them international exposure and condemnation. Um, this prompted a second strand of Cinepix activity that we can refer to as medical mili military and militant, militant home invasions that directly reflect terrorist fears. Now, when the CFDC's head, Michael Spencer, greenlit David Cronenberg's feature film debut, Shivers, also known as they came from within, as a Cinepix horror title, the resultant production provoked a national controversy and even parliamentary debate upon its release in 1974. What's fascinating is David Cronenberg is a fully fledged Canadian citizen, um, but some of the other producers uh, uh, weren't fully fledged Canadian citizens. They were people who were working in Canada and the, the controversy was so severe that the government were even toying with the idea, could we revoke these producers um, citizenships to get them out of the country because of the stink that Shivers has made. Um, it provoked a national controversy, specifically the theme of genetically modified venereal parasites infecting normally law-abiding middle-class suburban dwellers was greeted with outrage, particularly when it was revealed that effectively the state had funded it through the tax shelter scheme. And the most prominent critic of Shivers was Robert Fulford. And he wrote a, a most infamous review entitled, You Should Know How Bad This Film Is, After All You Paid For It. And here he criticized the filmmakers behind Shivers, but also the Canadian film development head, Michael Spencer, who he argued was responsible for financing a production that was, quote, a disgrace to everyone including the taxpayer. 
Now, what's interesting, as with the maple syrup porn productions that preceded them, Cinepix horror productions such as Shivers are uncomfortable, but they're uncomfortable for a different reason because they're uncomfortable mirrors to 1970s Quebec society where the quiet revolution had mutated into a violent revolution. Specifically, there was a terrorist cell called the FLQ or Quebec Liberation Front that waged a long and bloody campaign of bombings, kidnappings and urban insurrection to further cement a political separatist agenda. And within this context, I think the Cinepix horror titles are directly linked to these wider 70s fears. So if anyone has seen um, um, Shivers, for instance, throughout the backdrop of the film, there's a radio broadcast. And all the time you hear on this radio broadcast, all of these atrocities occurring in widespread Montreal. And at the end of the film, the infected middle class suburban dwellers leave their condominium to further create chaos in this already conflicted sphere. So there's a definite idea of dystopia running through those um, Cinepix horror releases. And I, and I think it's particularly marked in the 1977 film, Rabid, which was another Cinepix collaboration with Cronenberg. Um, this film uses an episodic narrative structure to detail how a young woman infects um, a series of Montreal city dwellers after a botched experiment. Noticeable in the film's original marketing seen here on the, my right, your left, is the tagline, the shocking story of a city in panic. And I think it's relevant because this sentiment resonates with wider conceptions of the violated urban space during the period of the FLQ's terrorist campaign. So the group's violent manifesto of, of murder and insurrection led to the government's 1970 War Measures Act, following their kidnap and assassination of employment minister Pierre Laporte. So what happened was the government effectively encased Montreal in a military siege scenario to, to kind of root out these terrorists, um, subjecting its citizens to a state of military containment, which I think is perfectly uh, represented in David Cronenberg's film Rabbit. Now, just before I close, some final thoughts. Um, not content with causing outrage, um, Cinepix then went on in the mid 70s to create a series of films known as the Ilsa series. Now, they weren't necessarily contemporary films, they often had a historical setting, but they um, can be identified as a third Cinepix trend where these historical dramas functions as metaphors of contemporary Canadian fears of internment and repression. Now, the Ilsa series comprised um, an, a, a range of releases, including Ilsa She-Wolf of the SS from 1975, Ilsa Harim Keeper of the Oil Shakes from 1976, and Ilsa Tigress of, the, of Siberia from 1977. They're, even now, they're, they're really unsettling and disturbing movies, I have to say. And they detail the grisly misadventures of a sadistic female prison camp warden and governess played by Diane Thorne, the American actress. Now, very few articles have been published, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, on the Ilsa series. But Paul Karoop has identified the Ilsa films as, quote, the illegitimate and unacknowledged daughter of the Canadian film industry. And why he means this is that Dunning and Link specifically underplayed the national anchors in the, in the series, even providing pseudonyms for the crew so that they couldn't be traced back as Canadian films because they already knew how controversial these releases would be. So it's not really until one of the later films, Ilsa the Tigress of Siberia, of, of Siberia which is set in contemporary Montreal, that the genuine Canadian origins of the series really come to the fore. Now, it, they're undoubtedly controversial films, but for Paul Carew, once again, there's a distinctly Canadian marker that takes them beyond the idea of Canada's great shame. Um, specifically, he notes that there's a focus, even a fetish, for torture imagery and, and the paraphernalia of torture. Um, and he notes that these symbols are closely connected to a period of authoritarian Catholic regime in French Canada, where particularly women were tortured, single mothers were tortured, 
orphan children were abused. So there's a kind of mind map that's uncomfortably familiar to the Canadian populace, which is why he feels these films um, uh, do have a Canadian currency. Um, as with the later slasher films that, that Cinepix did, again, they're not the same as North uh, or American stalk and slash films. They seem to have a, a kind of Canadian stamp that takes them beyond the, the derided stamp of um, Canada's great shame. Um, now, unsurprisingly, following the collapse of the capital cost allowance, Dunning and Link's activities were, were greatly curtailed. They did continue to produce horror titles, albeit with diminishing, diminishing budgets, and eventually returned to distribution. I think they got the last laugh, however, because eventually their company was amalgamated into a, a, a business company that was emerging, and that company was called Lionsgate. And Lionsgate are now one of the most prolific producers of horror from everything from the Saw franchise to, uh, you know, all of the key um, horror releases are Lionsgate releases. So ironically, um, Canada's great shame has become Canada's great investment, which is interesting how history works. So to conclude, although the works of Dunning and Link have been neglected by key accounts Canadian film, Ben Wright argues that their output, alongside the other creators who use tax shelter funding, should not be rejected as a hiccup in national cinema practice. It's a quote by him. Um, by annexing film industry trends to wider social and political horrors, um, these films provide a crucial insight into Canada's quiet revolution of horror. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Savio. It's so interesting here, like hearing you talk through it. It's uh, fascinating. Um, I think if there's any justice now, people are going to be looking, where the hell can I get the Turkish straw dogs? I must watch that this evening. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I I think I, we probably have the questions, and I know I know it's probably late for everyone, but um, I I find it really interesting that you talk about this idea of of the films being almost like a funhouse mirror to what's happening in real life and I'm wondering whether that's whether you see it as like is it like a cathartic expression of or or is it I don't know is it a way of like proving that you know we can overcome what's happening fascinating yeah or, it, 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 it could be both of the above and of course an economic to desire to make money, you know, so I think the thing is, I, I'm always, although it's a contradictory term, these are horror films and they're also exploitation films, and we, we talk about exploitation, exploitation films are effectively exploiting contemporary fears, they're not just exploiting contemporary cinema trends, they're looking at what, what is, you know, what, what is out there, I mean, my PhD student and I today were asked, why do slasher films never die? And the reason slasher films never die is they recycle themselves to directly express the contemporary fears of their teen, post-teen audiences. So there's most definitely a catharsis there. And I guess, Aggie, like, by using the word catharsis, you're, re you're already, in a way, providing a bit more of an intellectual justification of these films than their critics and detractors would would give us. I, I do think these are, they're contradictory films, but they're fascinating, you know, um, just because they are such a, they're almost like a production line of fears and phobias in Canada during that decade. Mm. Yeah, I also find it really fascinating that someone mentioned that there's a higher percentage of female, or, like audience members of horror generally, which is like, re yeah, really interesting, particularly in regard to like the content of the film. Um, yeah, so and actually, I mean, if you look at horror audience, look at the colleagues we have in the room, you know, and, and, and I found this when I was running the MA in cult film, that it was largely, you know, professional women, uh, you know, women who loved horror and had a, a, a often significant position in society. So um, th there's a lot going on in these films that I think we need to get under the bonnet of, and, you know, it's, to your, to your grace that you've got this horror program that will allow colleagues in this room to do that. Yeah, I'm wondering, does anyone else have any questions? James, go ahead. 
Hey, thank you. Um, I just had a question in regards to what you touched on to start with, because yeah. um, what we've talked about is a lot of the, I guess, the revolution of the genre of horror within that time period. And you said you had been working with a student on um, slasher films and how it relates to like queer horror and the current sort of genres. I just want to know what what you think how right now is um, similar to that time period in regards to like what is the revolution of horror right now, what you're correlation between the two decades is? I think it's much, I, I kind of feel we're in a fascinating period right now because I, I think it, the focus is much more around belonging and identity. And I think, you know, whether that's issues of sexuality and, you know, the, the, the diaspora of sexuality and horror or the whole idea of race and ethnicity. And it, it, what I'm finding fascinating James, linked into that is the way in which we're seeing more and more, if I use the term diasporic filmmakers, colleagues probably know what I mean. These are filmmakers who travel from one culture to another and they bring their own cultural baggage with them, um, working in, in the genre and they're making for such amazing stories. So forgive me if I'm wrong, what, did it flag up that you're in, are you in New Zealand? Yes, yes I am. Yeah, yeah. It, it struck in my mind, and I'll tell you why, because um. One of the most recent and most interesting uh, indigenous horror, Canadian horror films I saw is called Night Raiders by a female director called Danis Goulet. It's an amazing movie. I really recommend people check it out. And it was a Can Canadian New Zealand co-production. And in this Canadian New Zealand co-production, there are in indigenous cultures from both nations working together to stop aliens taking their children away and indoctrinating them into state into state into a state mindset so clearly that's a, a, a very thinly disguised um, uh, attack on what happened in Canada and actually happened in in other indigenous led cultures where indigenous children were taken away and their names and their cultures and their heritages were changed now why I raise that is at no point in this narrative did they say geographically guys how did we yeah, you were you were in New Zealand. I was in Canada. How did we get together? It's never really raised. Well, it's just the idea that there are common cultures that are oppressed that come to fight the man together, and those cultures that come to fight the man can be indigenous, can be diasporic, can be ethnic, can be sexual. They are ultimately other. Cool. That's very relevant to um, my practice. So thank you so much for that. Anyone else? Or anyone, does anyone want to perhaps uh, ask for some film recommendations based on what projects you're doing? That might be a really, <laughs> it's, this is an amazing opportunity. Yeah, I mean, uh, for example, since we're talking like uh, how horror it's related to the current times and like the general themes and topics of the current times. Now, I'm, I'm in my practice here for the university. I'm working on relationships like between human and non-human, especially like plants and vegetation. And I mean, there's already like a huge... Um, there has been a huge production, uh, especially in, in the past. And now there's like, there are some movies where that's like in between the various scenarios, like in a general, like it's more about the sceneries in general, it's like the forest or, the, but there's always like a cabin in for it. It's like, do you have any recommendations about uh, any movies where the like nature becomes the actual yeah. protagonist? Well, I think there's a long, there's actually, I'm going to make a really odd connection here. And yeah, I, I was going to say, um, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll love to answer these questions. And James and co, yes, I forgot to say on my end slide is my email address. So I'll, I'll give Aggie the slides and I'd be delighted to dialogue with you. Uh, and um, if there's any, you know, we, we have a great horror culture at BCU, so I'm sure colleagues and students there would love that dialogue. So the odd connection is going to be, human 
plant whiteness. And that seems like a really weird thing because the, the majority of these um, releases where you have the cabin in the woods and nature out of control always occur in a, a largely seem to occur in a, in a, um, uh, a, a rural um, space, normally a, a North American space. And this is quite fascinating to me. And, and I, there was some research, there was a group of, a fascinating group of scholars um, that became known as the white trash theorists. And what they did is they looked at the eugenics movement in America that was prolific in the late 19th century and the early 20th century that argued that um, rural dwellers were um, a different species to the urban American man. And if anyone has seen the original Wrong Turn, that in the montage, opening montage for Wrong Turn, there's a series of distorted black and white photographs. That, they're actually from the eugenics movement. That what the eugenics movement ignored was the fact that extreme poverty and disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement took place in these rural sectors. So it was that, yeah, it was a convenient way of not saying why are people poor and backward, but why are they different species? Now, I'm currently revisiting some of, of, of those debates because I've got a new project that I'm trying to develop and hopefully it'll be another documentary. And it, it's, it's, it is around the idea of white trash in American film. But what I'm interested in is actually, I think there's a, the subliminal racial references because of the post-civil rights influence of African-American culture and life, it's no longer applicable to project otherness onto the black body. So what it's projected onto is onto the diseased white rural body. So Richard Dyer, the theorist makes a fascinating claim. He says, these, the uh, rural dweller is monstrously white. And what he means by monstrously white is the pallor of their skin is not the same as the urban male. Now, it's not just the rural dweller, but the rural dweller's environment that runs amok and runs riot. So if you look at those nature revolt narratives, they're always linked to the uncivilized rural lands. They're, you know, I mean, they're there in contemporary films, there's a series of films back in the 70s, Grizzly. William Girdler was an amazing uh, white trash animal run wild director. He did two films that are really worth looking at. Grizzly is one of them. And then he did another movie called Day of the Animals where every single animal from ant to lion to giraffe just to says enough, <laughs> enough. And they just literally take their environment back in the most gruesome way. Uh, Long Weekend is a fascinating Australian film, if you want an outback example, where a couple go into the wilderness recovering from, I think it's a, the, the wife has had an abortion or there's some tension. And so the whole outback literally invades this couple. You know, so there's definitely something there in your fascinating project. Look beyond the animals and look at the rural cultures that situate them and specifically look at American cultures. And again, if you need any references at another time, I'm happy to provide those. Thank you so much. I, I have a list of questions myself. I don't know if anyone else has, has anything else that they want to ask, but one thing I think that you've brought up that's really fascinating, uh, particularly we're looking at institutions and that all, all the researchers here are contacting institutions to collaborate with um, you, and using horror as a means to, to discuss with those institutions. But I think one thing that you brought up that's really fascinating is that horror itself is it an institution and the yeah. fact that like you know where that it comes with its own problems and the government funding that comes with it and at the like you know this is a charity organization that's also has funding that comes with its own problems and i think that it's really interesting to have a look at like you know even you were saying the time of year that the films are produced can yeah, be effective. absolutely and also we we, we need to be cautious and this might be a closing comment I, I, I Lindsay may still be with us I'll refer to Lindsay's comment as my closing comment but I, I've met most of my idols over the years you know and that, that's been a real joy of running Cine Access um, and 
The weird thing is some of them as are as you imagine them to be and they're an honor to be in their company. Some you think are really left wing and radical and they turn to out not to be like that. They sort of sit there thinking, I just can't see that because I've, I've read your films as these most radical, almost like communistic, you know, kind of pro proto-feminist texts and I'm, I'm struggling here. Other people you, before you meet them, you're cautious because you think, oh, they're quite, they seem quite conservative and right wing. And they turn out to be the reverse. So I think that adds, an, and the, when you say horror is an institution, it's a complex institution, right? So we have to be aware of those complexities. Um, linked into that, if this helps Lindsay at all, and I guess Aggie, at some point you have or, or will be dealing with the work of the abject and Julia Kristeva and bodily anxiety. So um, there's a whole range of work around, particularly the leaky female body. Um, not really a horror film, but fascinating film for me is um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Predator and the whole idea of what happens when these men in the jungle, their masculinity is confronted by an alien who embodies both racial difference, dreadlocks, and a fusion of masculine and feminine traits, an armored phallic body armor, but with very feminized breastplate and, and nails. And um, linked into body anxieties is mo most definitely smell. There's a number of sources around th the civilization of manners and smell that can be that can be linked to, to this. Also, I'd maybe ask Lindsay to look at horror exploitation films, particularly in the 1950s, came up with all these gimmicks like smell -arama. So you could smell the horror, you know, so the way in which Again, going back to the horror institution, they link into these fears. Um, but body horror is a whole lecture in its own right, and I'm sure you're going to deal with that. But it's a fascinating issue. Thank you so much. Uh, any final, one final question, anybody? Emily? Is Emily there? Yeah, mine is just, um, do you have any particular really hardcore slasher films to do with body horror? You know, like what is the most extreme films you've seen in terms of the visual side of it? Um, they're not necessarily slasher films. I mean, uh, uh, you know, some of them are... are very extreme, but you, you know, I think it's, it sounds really weird as, as you, at one of the cine excesses uh, a couple of years ago, we had the premiere of the remake of Last House on the left, Wes Craven's film. And I'll never forget one cinema viewer came up to me afterwards and said, I'm really upset. And I said, why are you upset? And he said, there was no disemboweling scene. And I thought, my God, I really am getting old. I was really glad there was no. Uh, uh, disemboweling scene. So um, the most, ex I guess, the, the things that, are, that unsettle me, Emily, are always around moral ambiguity, which is why, for me, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre remains still today the most terrifying film I've ever seen because of that lack of moral compass in the film. I, I first saw it on Betamax, shown my age, that old video format. We only had a black and white TV at the time. And I, it, because it was in black and white, I actually thought it was like a documentary drama because it was so shocking. And at every point I was hoping, please let there be some morality, but there was none. So I haven't really answered your, your question. I, in terms of slashers, one of the early slashers I find really disturbing is the, is the original Black Christmas. I don't know if you've seen that. That was in 1974. It hasn't had the... the um, the justice it's deserved, because it got dwarfed by John Carpenter's Halloween, but I won't spoil it for you, but again, lack of moral camper, um, lack of moral compass, lack of um, resolution, and a very, very disturbing view of abusive family structures. So, so that I think is something that re I find very uncomfortable. So, ch so check that out. Thank you so much, Savio. We might have to close up now, but it's been, I could listen to you talk and give us all these references forever. <laughs> so please keep in touch. And if you would be happy to give us your, your email. Um, I'll, you may type be... it, I'll type it in the uh, chat pane now. 
and I wish you all a pleasant evening. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and really keep the faith with this course. I think it's such a radical course. It really deserves support. So anything we can do from the UK to support it, we will. Thank you so much. Yeah, right, and, and keep in touch. Will do. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. And you, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Thank you so much for your time. Bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you.